So, you're the one who asked for me by name, huh? Might I ask why? Quiet type, huh? Well, that's not a problem. Come on in. You get the special package that only a very few people get. Anybody in there? Everything that you've just witnessed was inspired by true events. It was about an unsolved murder case in the Atlas area of Stockholm, Sweden. The year was 1932, and the poor woman that you've just witnessed that was murdered, her name was Lily Lindstrom, and her killer was never caught. That is what this episode is going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the horrid murder that happened. We're talking about who the possible suspects were in the murder. And the mysterious background behind what happened. This episode is about the Atlas Vampire. The year was 1932, and we were in Stockholm, Sweden, in the Atlas area to be exact. We're speaking about a poor, innocent victim by the name of Lily Lindstrom. She was 32 years old, and she lived in an apartment complex in the Atlas area. She engaged in the profession of prostitution, which is already a dangerous field to get involved in. But on this night of May 1st, 1932, it would prove to be fatal for poor Lily. And it would be the last client that she ever saw. It is believed that the original date of the murder was May 1st, 1932 or May Day in Sweden. Now this is a big celebration, and like anybody else, Lily wanted to celebrate. So, she gathered with her friend and fellow prostitute who lived in the apartment above her by the name of Minnie Jansen. Lily and Minnie had gathered earlier that day and planned what they were gonna do for the special day. Now as they were conversing in Lily's apartment, the phone rang. Minnie answered the phone and there was a client on the other end that asked for Lily personally. Now Lily also had a nickname of the call girl because she was the only one in the apartment that actually had a phone. But nonetheless, Lily comes and answers the phone and starts talking with the client. Now when she's talking with the client, the client client wishes for her to meet with them that very night on the night of the celebration. Now Lily thinks nothing of it, that it's just another client, and she agrees. She figures she could make some extra money before the celebration and then go and join everybody else once their meeting was over. So what she does is exactly that. She tells him 
to meet her at her apartment later that night, and they've been going with the meeting. The last person to see Lily alive was her dear friend Minnie. The last time that she was in contact with Minnie was she, Lily had called her later on that night after they departed and asked her for some condoms for later on that night for the meeting. Also, Minnie saw her returning home, no doubt to meet the client. This was around 9 o'clock that night. So, now after Minnie last saw her friend, there were only two people that know what really happened. One of them was never found, and the other, unfortunately, is dead. But, some common theories, or the most common theory, is the client that evening that asked for Lily by name was the one that killed her. Obviously, Lily did not make it to the celebration later that night. Minnie even went to the lengths of knocking on Lily's door to make sure, to make sure she was okay and if she was going to come down with her. There was no answer. But Minnie did kind of just shook it off and thought that her and the client had left earlier and already went down. So Minnie went and joined everybody else. What she didn't know was her dear friend was dead on the other side of the door. Now three days pass. We're now at May 4th, 1932. And there is still no word from Lily. And Minnie now becomes genuinely concerned that she hasn't heard from her friend. So, she calls the authorities. The cops come and knock on the door. There's no answer. They bust their way into the apartment. What they saw next, no amount of training could prepare them for what they saw. They entered the apartment. They curiously looked around for any signs of a break-in a robbery, anything. They eventually made their way into the bedroom. And in the bedroom they found Lily Lindstrom dead, completely naked, laying face down on her bed. When they went to look at the body, the body was oddly pale, which could be explained for it lying there for three days. But what else was odd was that the body seemed oddly thinner than normal. But they didn't, they didn't know why. What they found at the scene was also very odd because nothing was disturbed, there was nothing that was taken, but they found her clothes from that night on May 1st folded neatly at the end of the bed what they found near her clothes sent horror through everybody's mind. They found a soup ladle that was lying near the clothes and inside the soup ladle it was stained with blood. The blood of one Lily Lindstrom. Later examination shows that Lily's body had been drained of most, if not all, of her blood. And in the cop's opinion, the soup ladle was used to drink the blood. Now, however much blood that this person drained, if they did in fact drink it, they drank it all because there was no blood at the scene. There was no blood on the clothes, no blood on the sheets, no blood on Lily herself. So then that begs another question. How did they drain her of the blood? Now obviously, the cops did not want this case leaking to the public or the press because of obvious reasons. But like most things, it did get leaked. And everybody started nicknaming this the Vampire Murder. Now they, the cops searched endlessly for this man, or woman, 
and they, they couldn't find anything. They interviewed many, because she was the last person to see Lily alive, other than the client. And many could not identify the voice that she heard on the phone the night before. She couldn't really identify anything. They also went and they interviewed 80, that's right, 80 of Lily's clients. None of them were pushed any further because they didn't believe they committed the crime. Now, at the time in the 30s, they did have fingerprinting in the law enforcement, and they also did have um, tests where they could test the blood. But, like I said before, there was no blood at the scene, and the man or woman left no fingerprints. Now, what they really could have used at the time was DNA testing, but unfortunately in the 30s, it was not around. So it was hard to catch this man if he left no evidence behind to trace his trail. Now, unfortunately, there were no witnesses to this crime. So nobody can say who did it or what did it. But the facts are there that Lily was mysteriously drained of most of her blood. Them not knowing how, the blood was drank. And the reason of her death on later examination was that her skull was crushed by blunt force trauma to the head. Now, in my research and readings, there are some elements to this story that do suggest that maybe a mythical creature like a vampire could have done this. The super strength they possess, the drinking of the blood, and the mysteriously disappearing and never being found again. Now, obviously I'm not sitting here saying that a vampire committed these murders, but it is a mysterious case and we can't necessarily rule out the strange or the supernatural in this case because the evidence is there. Now, whether or not a vampire actually snuck into Lily's apartment and killed her and drained her and drank her blood and smashed her skull. Or if the client himself was the vampire or it was just a case of pure cold-blooded murder. The case is still cold and the investigation is still there. But there is one thing that the Lily Lindstrom murder case and the Atlas Vampire story tells us is to, when you see a stranger on the street at night that seems a little off or odd, and they approach you, you need to question, are they really who they say they are, or are they something else? that we thought wasn't real and was only made to scare us.